So this morning, we will be in Matthew chapter 15, looking at verses 1 through 9. Now, I really overstudied for this message. I have so much more, and I wish if you were tolerant enough, we could actually go through it all, which would mean we'd have to spend an extra half an hour here, and and some are going, yay. (laughs) I won't do that, I promise. An hour, <laughs> but I will try to give you what I feel the Spirit is leading, and is is very important. I love this message; I really do. The Lord just put it together, and not just now, but while I was putting it together, and I just learned so much from it. Bless you. And so this morning's theme is uh, wiggled out, wiggled out. What what does that mean? You ever wiggle out of something? Right? Aren't we really good at wiggling out of something when, when, when a situation occurs and we like, oh, interrupt the person while they're talking? Like, oh, look, what, what happened over there? And we wiggled ourselves out of that you know, request because we diverted to another subject and got them off the subject. You know, we, we wiggle our ways out of things. We're really good at wiggling our way out of things, aren't we? There was a woman who had lost her handbag while she was Christmas shopping. Well, a little honest boy found it and she returned the handbag to the woman. And the woman opened up the handbag to look and see that everything was there and she said, oh my, I had a $20 bill in here and now I have $21 bills here. And the little boy just kind of looked up real quick and said, the last time I found the purse, the lady didn't have change for a reward. Being responsible pays, right? Right. First service, they were dead tired. They did like not a, not a giggle at all. I'm like, wow. So I actually stopped in the middle of service. Let's stand up and let's raise our hands. And okay, are we awake yet? Because <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> uh, but responsibility does pay, doesn't it? Being a responsible person. Uh, Today we're going to um, talk about wiggling our ways out of responsibility. That is the religious leaders and talk about religion and so forth. The scribes and the Pharisees, they they really put more worth into their religion and their traditions than they did in God's word. In fact, they would rather break God's word than break their own traditions. Uh, The Pharisees are going to come from Jerusalem. They'll approach Jesus They'll accuse his disciples of not keeping their traditions. And then Jesus will respond and point out their inconsistencies and then condemn them by quoting the prophet Isaiah. That's the context in these nine verses. Now let's remember why Matthew wrote Matthew. Remember, Matthew is presenting Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, and so remember that verses or chapters 1 through 10 reveal that king very clearly, that Jesus is the king. He is, he is connected to King David. He is in the line of the Messiah. And now as king, we see in chapters 11, all the way to the rest of the book, that this king will be rejected by his own people. And it begins... Uh, This morning in this chapter here, 1 through 20, talks about this tradition that the religious men held to. This morning I have three points. Religion keeps you from God. Religion keeps you from God. Hypocrisy conceals sin. And then the third one is grace saves. Grace saves. And thank God for grace because truly we need grace. We need grace. So let's read the the text to get the context here. Then the scribes, verse 1, and Pharisees, who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of our elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And then he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your traditions. For God commanded, saying, and he gives this example of this transgression, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your traditions. Hypocrites. 
Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you? These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching doctrines, the commandments of men. The scribes and the Pharisees who came from Jerusalem asked Jesus a specific question. They took the time to travel from Jerusalem to get to where Jesus was to attack him and trap him. That is their whole plan from this day forward. And their question was, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Josephus says that there were about 6,000 religious leaders at that time within that system who were coming from Jerusalem, a few of them to entrap Jesus. And up to this point, Jesus' ministry really has been in the area of Sea of Galilee or Judea. And now Jerusalem is getting involved. And these guys had come from a long way just to challenge Jesus. So some of the times these scholarly men are so educated for their own good. Have you ever met an educated person? I mean, really educated, intellectual, and you try speaking with them and you're just like, I have no idea what you just said. Just by the words that they use, just goes, I don't even think they know what they're saying. But it just sounds really smart, right? Educated people sometimes just want to argue. And they argue because they can, and they really want to make themselves look good and make you look like an idiot. (laughs) That's their whole point. Someone said discussion is an exchange of knowledge. Argument is an exchange of ignorance. Mark Twain said the trouble with the world is not that people know too little, but that they know too many things that aren't so. That aren't so. Knowing the Bible is wisdom. That's knowledge. But knowing a lot of other things, who knows? And we have that problem in our day and age. I know I've succumb to some of those things you go on Facebook and you wonder what is really true and what isn't true it's so easy to be misled uh, by by some of the articles and then of course we know what's going on in the political world this false news that's going around all over the place so we're challenged aren't we to really study and try to figure out what is real and what isn't real anymore strange The question was asked Jesus, why did his disciples transgress the oral traditions of the elders? Uh, They came right to the point. They didn't mix punches, immediately attack him. Notice that they didn't really attack Jesus' attitude towards the traditions, but they attacked the disciples and their practice. And they called it transgressing the traditions of the elders. The word transgressing means to go by or the side of. And so in other words, you just totally bypass it. They just bypass it. They just ignored it. That's a transgression against the elders. Why did they do that? Break the oral law. The Jews, of course, had written law, but they also had oral law. They had the five books of Moses on top of that. Then they developed what they call the oral law uh, to interpret the written law. And of course, they had many laws within that, and they became traditions that they followed throughout the years. And they really embraced these traditions. They highly respected them and honored and protected them with everything they had. Traditions refer to any kind of teaching, written, spoken, handed down from generation to generation. And these were oral traditions, uh, many times even superseding the law, superseding the law of God. They were supposedly handed down from Moses to the religious leaders. And the question was, why do they not wash their hands before they they eat here? What's so bad about washing your hands? Is is that really what they're talking about? There's nothing wrong with washing your hands. Virginia has has a rule, and she's always reminding us, wash your hands, wash your hands. As soon as the kids get right through the front door, did you go wash your hands right now? You know, that's a rule, especially when you see what people are doing and what they're eating uh, today. You know, the dirt that they're playing with, the oil, the dogs, the cats, the goats, the pigs. And that's just my house, you know, <clears throat> all of that stuff. And then you go to enjoy a delicious meal, you know, and you have all this stuff on your hands and you're eating. But that's not what's the point here. The point here is about ceremonially being defiled 
because you did not wash your hands. So the scribes and the Pharisees follow the traditional ceremony when they wash their hands uh, before each meal and sometimes even before the course <clears throat> of meals and sections of meal, depending on how pious you were. Oftentimes what they would do is they would begin to wash their hands in a basin or a bowl of some sort and they would wash their hands really well, but they wouldn't wash them this way. They tried to wash this way and let the water flow down and then bring their hands up slowly and arms and they let the water drip and so that everything went down this way so that everything stayed clean and then take a cloth and again a ceremonial way clean dry their their hands and then they were able to go and it was like a surgeon now I can eat honey <laughs> and then eat their food and if they were really pious they would do that in between you know each uh, groups of food that they'd have back and forth back and forth and it was interesting because they really believed that this is what kept them near God by keeping these traditions. Listen to what Paul said on the topic of traditions. He says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Traditions. You know, Christmas is a tradition. And I don't mean to be humbug or anything, because I, I love Christmas. It's, it's one of the happiest times that I can remember as a kid and, and, and as an adult and as a parent and, and even as a grandparent. I, I'll be the first to say I love Christmas. But the fat, jolly old man, I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I have not seen that guy in our house for almost 30 years now. I, I just struggle with that. But Christmas is a tradition. We really don't know the, the actual date of Christ's birth. So we do it as a remembrance to his birth. That should be the focus. And, and by the way, I don't mean to offend anyone. It does sadden me a little bit when you teach your kids to go find joy and happiness and peace to sit on Santa's knee instead of teaching them that peace and happiness comes from Jesus Christ. You know, that saddens me a little bit, but that's just me. We have the liberty to definitely enjoy Christmas. You really do. And don't let me stop you from doing that. I'm just saying it is a tradition. Easter is a tradition. They really are. And many other worldly things are traditions. We need to be careful that they don't lead us to false faith, though. That's what's important. Enjoy Christmas, but if you think that it's all about the jolly old man, then something's wrong with your faith. That's where it becomes, I believe, sin. I grew up in a church of traditions, lots of traditions. The Catholic Church is deep with historical traditions, a lot of them. Uh, John Calvin used to wear a hat. <clears throat> and as he wore this hat, other men started wearing hats, and it became a tradition. Two men were arguing about wearing a hat and not wearing a hat. And finally they saw John Calvin and says, Hey, why is it that we should wear a hat? He says, Well, I wear a hat because of the pigeons. And because it gets cold at night, why would you want to wear a hat? Traditions, it's amazing what they'll do. We need to be very careful. What about praying? This is interesting. What about praying with your eyes closed? We've made that into a tradition within the Christian church. You, know, you, you sit at the table and say, okay, everybody, we're going to pray for our meal. Close your eyes, kids. Otherwise, God don't hear you. No cheating. And then you keep your eye open, you know, watch and see if they, they got their eyes closed. You know, we do that, right? We, we gather in groups and so forth. And it's almost like if we're, if, if we're not practicing keeping our eyes closed, our head bowed, that somehow God isn't going to hear us or we can't be clear or we're going to be a distraction. But actually, you'll be surprised to know that nowhere in the Bible does it say to close your eyes. Nowhere at all. The closest you can get to it is where Jesus says, go into your closets and pray. But he's talking about isolating yourself from all the distractions of the world and so forth. And they take that to mean, no, don't let anyone see you. Close your eyes and no one can see you. You're like pulling the covers over your head and the boogeyman will go away. You know? <clears throat> but really, that's a tradition. I'm tempted to one day say, let's keep our eyes closed and let's pray. That would feel so awkward, wouldn't it? I think it would feel awkward for me. Not that it, uh, for me to keep my eyes open, but to, for me to see you all with your eyes open. That's where the awkwardness would, would come because we do it so much that it has become embedded in us and we think it's a norm when in reality it's not. 
It really isn't. So we really do need to be careful about traditions. I mean, definitely kneeling to pray. Oh, we find that in Scripture all over. Facing down on the ground, prostrated before the Lord, or even standing before the Lord, or our hands stretched out before... Oh, we find all those things. Nothing wrong with that at all. Those are scriptural and biblical. But traditions can be really funny. How people will cling to those traditions, but that yet they can be very dangerous too. Very dangerous. And so my first point, re- religion keeps you from God. Religion keeps you from God. Uh, Due to the wide range of its usage in the English language, religion, or the Latin word religo, is not easily defined. Most commonly, however, it refers to ways in which humans relate to God. Religion is often used to refer to a system of beliefs related to practices, that, that play certain roles within people's lives and how they approach God or hopefully to approach some sort of deity. You see it in Buddhism. You see it in humanism. And by the way, you see it in atheism. It is a religion because it is a practice of, of certain beliefs. And their belief is that there is no God. And so who do they worship? They worship their own intellect and their own will. And so, yeah, they have religion. Religion, by definition, means to be bound by rules and regulations and rituals in order that one may obtain some sort of salvation, whatever that salvation may be. You see, religion is humanity trying to reach God by their own efforts, while Christianity is God paying the price Himself, in essence, reaching down to us and creating a relationship with us. Creator God and man having a relationship sometimes you fill out those applications that say what religion you are and we usually put christianity that's not our religion christianity is not our religion i usually put relationship with jesus christ that's what our religion is if you were to call it a religion it is a way in fact the early church was called the way it's how they lived their lives on a daily basis it wasn't that we were Christians. You know, it's not that we're going to stand before God one day and he's going to say, so what church did you go to? Well, Calvary Chapel. He goes, oh, okay. And how about you, Baptist, Lutheran? It's not going to matter. Did you love my son, Jesus Christ? It is a relationship. There is a biblical definition for religion, and you can find uh, the precise equivalent of the English word religion in the Greek or Hebrew scriptures. Uh, the Greek word is theokis, is used of the New Testament in f- a few places, but its meaning is limited to cer- ceremonial observances or worship. And however, the Bible does define what is expected from a true follower. We do find religion being pure in the pastoral epistles pertaining to orphans and widows, but again, it's service towards others. Paul calls that pure religion, but he's not talking about salvation. The Bible is the basic manifestation of the will of God, of his mind, and it describes what religion of God we should have, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ, the way. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father, and that's what religion is, trying to get to the Father, but you get through it through Jesus Christ. And so religion really is, should not be a part of our vocabulary. If, if you're going to call yourself anything, say, I'm of the way. What do you mean by that? Well, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. And so it's a personal relationship with God. You see, God never intended Christianity to be a religion. It is a way of life. It's how you live your daily life with God. When you fill out that application, I think that you have now a choice to put Christianity or to put a relationship with Jesus Christ Humankind is by our very nature designed so by our creator to draw towards relationships. We really are. He's designed us that way. Everything is about relationship. Whether it's between a husband and a wife, parents, children, 
friends, acquaintances, and so forth. Relationships that range from family, friendships, and even material. And they're all important relationships. These relationships that we don't even think about give us insight into what God intends for us. From the time that we're born, we learn that the family relationship provides security, safety, unconditional love. That is why we call God what? Father. We call Him Father. That speaks of relationship. A healthy family creates a relationship of trust, security, encouragement. And as we grow older, we learn the value of loyal friends that we can trust and care for uh, and stand besides in time of need and so then we have Jesus who comes along and says I call you friends I call you friends so that speaks of again relationship as we mature we attract a certain person an individual male female who (laughs) you know uh, that we just fall in love with and we want an intimate relationship between that man or that woman and and we marry them we become one flesh as the Bible says We're, we're touched by them physically emotionally and even spiritually and we become one in within this marriage itself which is the pinnacle of what a relationship really is intimately true fellowship koinonia that intercourse fellowship and this is why Jesus is called the bridegroom and we're called what the bride speaks of relationship So it's not religion, it is definitely relationship because religion is dead works that lead to death. But relationship is what matters. It's always about relationship between us and God and how we live that relationship with him on a daily basis. It's how we live with one another. We should, though we do get away from it. We do sometimes try to work for our relationships with one. If I can please mom or dad, then I'll get this or that. And that's part of being in a religion. When if you were just to be faithful to do this and that on a regular basis and love your parents by doing this and that, then guess what? When you do ask, they'll probably say, yeah, no problem, son. Because they love you. So the scribes and Pharisees asked, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? That was their religion. They clung to it. And instead of answering the question, Jesus asked them a question. Why do, you, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your traditions? Their traditions permitted a man to disobey the law of God. Amazing. Amazing how they were okay with that. Jesus' disciples may have violated this tradition, but the Pharisees were violating God's command itself. And in fact, they declared a person unclean if you didn't wash your hands, which meant what? That they, did have, uh, they have been denied access to God. You can't have a relationship with God. God will not receive you because you're an unclean person. And so their tradition literally keeps them away from God instead of drawing them to God. And so Jesus went to the root of the matter by drawing attention to the fact that sometimes traditions which were intended to help people to keep God's law, really uh, led them to break God's law. We need to be careful of those traditions. Their concentration on the tradition would have led them to neglect the law of God, and not only neglect it, but to engage in practices that involved breaking it itself, and even relationships between men and women. He's saying basically because of your traditions, you break the law of God. And God commanded, and he gives us this example of what they were doing. Now, he might have been able to pick from other examples, but he chose this one. And he said in verse 4, God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. And that's what the Bible teaches. In the Old Testament, it's one of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Samuel also talks about it. We are to honor our parents. We're to respect them. We're to esteem them, the word means. That is our responsibility. That was their responsibility. That was the Messianic law. And if your parents need help, you take care of your parents. You, 
you, you helped with taking care of your parents if that was the case. Now, I remember the times in the culture, there, was, there were no uh, social security, there's no pensions, there's no 401ks. So mom and dad, you know, one of them dies and now you have one left. And, and, and so you have to take care of them. They come into your house or, or you put them in a house and everybody pitches in to make sure that they have what they need. Or you, or, or you even get them involved in church, which... Paul talks about in the pastoral epistles about a true widow who has no one to take care of them needs to get involved in church and stay busy with the things of the Lord until the Lord takes them home. That is their responsibility. But if she's not a true widow, then the children are to take care of the widow. That was honoring your parents. He was very clear that we don't do that today because today with Social Security, pensions, 401ks, you have parents that are richer than their kids. So you're like, Mom, take care of me. But that still didn't mean that you could dishonor them, disrespect them. As Jesus said, you curse your father and mother. In other words, you speak, speak ill of them in front of others. You belittle them in front of others. You make fun of them in front of others. Those type of things. You abuse them. And then Jesus says, let them be put to death is what the law says. And that word in the Greek really means let them come to their end by death because they're being disobedient. Listen to what Proverbs says. The eye that mocks his father. He gets a little deeper, not just, not, not just you cursing or dishonoring them, but how about the looks you give them? We all know that looks can kill, right? That's, that's the, the phrase that we use because when someone looks at you, you're like, whoa, I felt that one like right, right there. We have a way with looks, right? We have all kinds of looks for different things. You know, when, when, when someone's saying something, you don't believe them, you're like, yeah, <laughs> a little. That's my, I just do, my little lip just goes up and like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I believe you. <laughs> we just, okay, he doesn't believe me. Not a word I'm saying. Or you're upset, like, mm-hmm, whatever. <laughs> we have those looks, right? Proverbs says, a eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. Like, wow, <laughs> that's extreme. But that's what the law required. And they were nullifying that law by their traditions. Scripture definitely leaves no doubt that we are to honor our father and our mother's And Jesus is talking about loving your parents and taking care of your parents. Where the scribes and Pharisees, they weren't doing that at all. Look look at what they were doing, verse 5. But you, and in the Greek when Jesus says, but you, it's emphatic. And he's looking at them as they ask this question. He says, yeah, but you? What about you? And he's probably shouting out a little bit. What about you? And then he says, whoever, which in the Greek means generally anyone else. So he's including everyone here, by the way, not just them. He's saying, yeah, what about you Pharisees and and whoever else says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. You see what they were doing? Because of their traditions. They had a tradition that they could dedicate uh, things to God and they would be set aside for the glory of God and for the temple of God or for the work of God. And so they could do that with their things. And so if their parents were in need, maybe they made a good profit that year. Well, they decided, well, I'm going to dedicate that profit to the Lord. Oh, sorry, Mom, I have nothing left over for you. Because it's dedicated to God, and so you get nothing. And so they would nullify God's commandment. And by the way, if I can suggest this, I think there's enough evidence here that says you can't even give to the Lord without taking care of your parents first. And so if you're tithing, even that, you couldn't say, well, I I tithe, Mom, and that goes to the Lord. You'll have to not eat for a month. I'm sorry. They were doing that. So stop tithing and make sure your mom has food on the table. I'm sure the Lord will, will do without your tithing. Our God is rich, more than we can imagine. <clears throat> but that's what they were doing. Koban, Koban. Mom comes over, dad comes over, son, we're, we're not doing too good. We have a light bill, gas bill, you know, a water bill, and we, you know, could you help out a little bit? Koban, Koban. And they knew exactly what they were doing. Oh, okay, he's not going to help us. He's dedicated everything to the Lord, 
It's not his to give, it's God's. <clears throat> and Jesus says, you're breaking the law. Verse six, then he, then he need not honor his father and mother, thus you shall, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. In other words, you've revoked it. You just revoked it. It's like you, you took a pencil and you took God's law and you said, that don't apply to me. Wow. Be careful, the Bible says, those who delete or add from the word of God. And that's what they were doing. <clears throat> they put more emphasis on the oral law than God's written law, traditions. <clears throat> and that's what hypocrisy does, right? Hypocrisy conceals sin. <clears throat> they, didn't, they, they really didn't want to help their parents. And so they concealed that sin by saying, oh, it's dedicated to God. I can't help you, Mom. I really love to, but I can't. But you see, God comes first. We can find all kinds of scriptures on hypocrisy. First John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother is a liar. Isn't that not hypocrisy? I say I love God, but yet you hate your brother. That's hypocrisy. James 1, 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's hypocrisy. If you think you're religious, yet you go around dividing and gossiping and tearing people down, that's hypocrisy. You're not having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, 5 says, you hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your, your brother's eye. Remove the hypocrisy first, and then you can see clearly. A hypocrite is one who acts contrary to what they say or what they believe. In effect, Jesus described a hypocrite as the sad state of a person who reduces himself to being an actor on a stage because he does not know the God of our Father or our Father God. And so he becomes an actor and he's playing a role. And this is a religious role. There are people who live their lives in a desperate search for human approval and applause. And I think that's what the religious leaders were doing. They wanted approval from the community, from Jesus, that their religion was legitimate, that they loved God, and they were trying to show it by their works and their actions. They discerned their dignity and their worth not from God, but from human beings and what they thought of them. They were more concerned about what people thought than what God thought. They were willing to adapt themselves to any role in order to achieve that. They were willing to play any role, to wear any mask, so that the audience were convinced that they were pious or righteous, right? They were actors, and they wanted the applause. They wanted the approval. <clears throat> A hypocrite cannot be honest with themselves or with others. You see, they're trying to gain favor from others, and so they play a role. And they come into church and like, praise the Lord, hallelujah. God is so good. And then they go down afterwards to the street somewhere and they're cussing and swearing. Blank, 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 blank. Well, what happened there? Well, I had a mask in church and now I have another mask because I have friends that do that and I've got to put this mask on. Even though it hurts at times and I know it's wrong, I still have this mask on because I got friends here. And that's hypocrisy. They deceive themselves and others also. <clears throat> and they come in and they partake of communion and the body of Christ. And, and they go out afterwards and they drink and they get drunk. And they got mask. And it's almost like they're, they have a mask for every occasion. And they don't know which mask sometimes they're even wearing. All for approval of man. Isn't that a sad state to be? To live? It really is when, when rea in reality, it's all about relationship. We shouldn't have to put masks on. Boy, I'm hurting just like you're hurting. We all sin just like one another. Anyone else sins. We all struggle. We're all weak. It's okay to be weak, to say, hey, I'm struggling, man. You, know, you don't have, no, I'm not struggling. You know, I'm okay. You don't have, I don't need nothing from you. It's like, okay. But it's just a mask when you really do. And that's what relationship is about, is being open and being able to uh, allow people to come in and share and, 
and to encourage and to comfort and that creates the body of Christ. <clears throat> you should, uh, you would be more correct to validate a Christian's faith in God <clears throat> than you would someone that played with a mask on who said they believed in God than one who was vulnerable to God and God's relationship with him. Jesus said, thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your traditions, you revoked it. So Jesus calls him hypocrite here in verse seven. And so he referenced uh, the prophet Isaiah, said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that word heart, heart is far, far from me is, is kind of like holds off from me. It's kind of like God's saying, I want your heart, but you're holding it off from him. You're pulling it back saying, no, 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 you can't have that. And Jesus keeps reaching down to take your heart because he wants to caress it and love it and, and soften it and love all over you. And you just like keep holding it back from him. So you hold it uh, far from me. They, they worship with their mouths. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts they hold back from me. People think they can draw near to me with their traditions, is what he's saying, with their songs, with their lips, service, but really, their hearts are far from me. They haven't given me their heart. People say the right things without really meaning it at all. We do that so many times. That's what this tolerance being polite, you know, all those, and nothing wrong with those things, but sometimes we, we just hold things back and we say things that we really don't mean. We love you, brother. It's like, really? You do? No, not really. I'm just kidding. <laughs> In our hearts, we may not. It's an issue of the heart. The religion really was all mouth. It was all lip service. It was nothing else. Their heart never approached the Lord. And so Jesus, and Jesus wanted their heart. Jesus, you know, uh, he was very clear when he told them, look, you're to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In other words, God wants all of you, every part of you. <clears throat> and so vain, they worship me in vain, teaching doctrines, the commandments of men. So religion based on human authority basically is worthless. It's no good. Doctrines, ordinances, traditions are, are only to be accepted if, if they agree with the word of God. They're very clear. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. So Jesus is concerned about the heart now it's interesting because jesus confronts these religious leaders man, and i wish i had the, the the strength and the gift like jesus did to confront people like that they're coming to destroy his people because now he's protecting his disciples why aren't they washing their hands and he didn't even answer their questions why are you breaking god's law with your traditions immediately just just went right back at them and then went into this whole example of how they did it See, and what God wants is us to realize that the disciples weren't breaking anything. They were eating, which they had a right to do, and they were enjoying their relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was going to protect that, and he did. And he'll do the same for you, by the way. That's what's so beautiful about this text, is that Jesus has our back. He's going to protect us from those that want to be religious. It's about grace. That's what grace is. So grace saves. Grace is the most important doctrine in the Bible. I really believe that. Probably in all of Christianity, even in the world, grace. In fact, I would venture to say that there is no other religion out there that teaches grace. It is only Christianity or the way that teaches grace. Every other religion out there is about works and how they can obtain salvation with God by their good deeds. So you know what? If you don't have the way, if you don't have Christianity and that relationship with Jesus, you ain't going to heaven no matter what. And that's sad. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. You know, we... <clears throat> and you run into people like this. 
and you're sharing with them the faith and what Jesus has done. And they just mock it. And you go, why would you do that? They, they truly don't understand it, what Jesus has done for them. And they think it's funny that we have a fairy tale that we believe in. And they don't have a problem mocking it and ridiculing it. It's like we're stupid, we're ignorant. We don't know what we're talking about. And yet we have the most precious gift in all the world. Who saves our souls from damnation and gives us eternal life. <laughs> I mean, talk about an insurance policy. <clears throat> talk about the most valuable thing in the world. It's not a huge diamond. <laughs> it is the grace of God. <clears throat> And it's clear in scriptures that it expressed clearly the promises of God that was revealed this grace of God which is embodied really in the walk of Jesus Christ himself. That he is grace. Grace is needed and best understood in the midst of sin, suffering, and brokenness, right? And that's when you really experience the grace of God. When you're sinning, Oh yeah, when you're in the midst of sinning and God's smiling down on you and he loves you because there's no height, no depth, no width, no power, no principalities can ever separate you from the love of God. But you can turn your back on God, but he loves you. And in the midst of that sin, he's telling you, hey, I love you, I love you. And you're going, man, and I'm sinning. What a wicked person I am. And yet he still loves you. And that's when you experience that grace. And that grace can do two things. It'll either turn you from him or draw you back to him. Or even suffering, when you're in the midst of suffering, right? And God's grace comes at that time when you need it. Or even brokenness where God wants you to finally say, I'm broken, Lord, and I just need your grace. We live in a world of earning, deserving, merit. But these things result in judgment. They really do. We, we teach our children these things. Well, unless you do this and this, I'm not going to give you that. And we need to incorporate grace in there somehow with our children i did that quite often i would teach them grace and i would show the other boys too what grace is i would sometimes just bless one of my boys just because of grace and i just bless them and they're like well why is he getting that grace well how come i don't i don't i'm not being gracious to you right now <laughs> but i'm teaching you that that's grace that's grace and they're like enjoying it. Hey, look. of course they like, look at me. Huh? Dad's giving me grace today. <laughs> He's loving all over me. But we need to teach them grace and not just this idea that you have to earn and deserve and merit. There's nothing wrong with earning and deser deserving and meriting things, but be careful that you understand those things don't lead to salvation or deepen our relationship with God at all. It is the grace of God that does that. Because only grace. Ephesians is filled with grace like 12 times it mentions the word word grace especially the one that we know the the most uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith and it's not of yourselves it is a gift of God why was the grace of God given to us because we need to understand the reason God saved us according to the Bible the law was given to show that we were sinners as Galatians says it was a tutor to teach us that we couldn't keep it. And once we understood the grace of God and how we embrace it, and we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then there's no need for the tutor anymore, Galatians uh, 3, 22 through 25 says. So clearly the grace of God was not given so that we could merely keep our traditions. God's grace is his unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor on those who have sinned. The Greek word is cherus, and it's used 150 times in the New Testament. The word refers to favor that God gives freely without expecting something in return. Don't expect anything but your heart, and he gives it freely to you. God provides his grace to us not because of anything we have done to earn it, and not because of anything God desires to get from you. God gives his grace to us freely of charge. All God encourages is us to walk with him by grace. Oh, we're going to fail as we walk with him. We're going to make mistakes, but he doesn't kick us out. He continues to embrace us. That's why people don't understand Christianity sometimes. We are to be like our Savior Jesus Christ with open arms always. And those open arms are always open for anyone to go and for anyone to come back to. You know, 
because God is gracious to us. And how many times have I gone and how many times have I come back? Personally, a lot. (laughs) Maybe not for a, a, a length of time, but in my own heart, I've been gone many a times and come back and God's grace has embraced me. And I thank God for, for his grace. And it is his grace that keeps me, by the way. So you see, in my life, the thing that hurts the most is when I abuse that grace. And yet he still has grace. It blows me away. He doesn't always chastise me. He doesn't always correct me. He just gives me more grace. And I'm like, Lord, that hurts more than the chastisement. And the correction, because you just love me even more. And I'm like, this is hurting. i got to stop this. And it takes some work on our part. Paul writes that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Because God's grace is unlimited. You can't exhaust it. Jesus already took the punishment And all believers are judged and treated well on the account of what Jesus did, not because of what we have done. So no sin is able to separate us from the love of Christ and the work of Christ. The religious leaders were keeping people from God by their traditions, where Jesus was trying to draw them to himself through grace. Let me close. A man's religion will find find ways of wiggling out of keeping God's law by grace. And we see this to be true in the religious leaders here transgressing God's law by their traditions. See, hypocrisy is not the Christian mask. That's not the Christian mask. The true Christian does not wear a a mask of hypocrisy. The true mask of Christianity of a Christian man is honoring his father and mother. That is the Christian mask of grace, of keeping the law and walking in love with one another. Be careful not to become religious, but walk in grace before the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples walked in grace. I'm wondering, it doesn't say, but we'll see a little bit more next week, but I'm wondering where the disciples are at at this point and what they're thinking as Jesus is confronting the religious leaders. And they're like, eating without their hands being washed. (laughs) I wonder how they felt. Wow, Lord, your grace is awesome. I'm not bound by the traditions anymore, but now by a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's our Father. He's our Father. He's our friend. And Jesus is the groom. And we are the church. What a beautiful relationship that is. Let's pray. Father, We thank you for the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. That it is one based upon the grace of God and not on our works, Lord. And so we are righteous because of his righteousness, which have been imputed to us, Lord. And we walk with him, not because we have to keep laws and rules and regulations or traditions, but we walk with him because we love him for what he has done for us, Lord. We keep his laws because we want to. And it's done by love for him. We know that there's good in them because they protect us from harm and from the evil one, Lord. And Lord, may you deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ and realize, Lord, that it is a walk of grace, that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a way of living our lives while we're here on this earth and while we're waiting to go home to be with you in the future, Lord. May your grace and mercies be upon us all, Lord, this morning, Father. And may you truly remind us, Father, that Christmas is not about traditions. It is about the birth of a Savior. It is a birth about God himself in the flesh walking among us to take our place on a cross so that we'll have eternal life. But more than that, we will have an abundant life here on this earth because we know that he wants to bless us as we love him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.